All right. Well, if everyone will go ahead and have a seat, we'll get started. All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. And um, if you just bear with me on the audio issues, we'll get that under control as we go. Can uh, Representative Walensky, can you signify if you can still hear us online? Yes, I can hear right, you. We're Chair. good to go. Thank you. All right, we'll begin uh, with an invocation. I'll call on Chairman Fleming. Please bow your heads. Lord, as always, we begin this House Judiciary Committee with asking that your presence be here and most importantly, your wisdom be with us as we attempt to do what is best for the people of this great state. Bless us and keep us as we move forward now. Amen. All right. Thank you. Um, we will uh, get started with our bills in just a moment, but I wanted to introduce a new member of my office staff. Garrison Douglas has joined my office. Garrison, if you just stand up. Uh, so if Garrison comes to uh, uh, ask you a question about a bill that's coming for judiciary or, or anything like that, uh, uh, you'll know uh, he's coming from our office and uh, really appreciate uh, having you to work with us this year, Garrison. So thank you. All right. So uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and proceed with the bills that we have on the agenda for today, beginning with House Bill 90, which is before you as a Judiciary Committee substitute for your review today. And we'll go ahead and call up Representative Williamson. And Mr. Caleb, you want to come up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I come back before you. Well, I come to the full committee today presenting the committee substitute to House Bill 90. And the LC number is 412887S. Uh, I've mentioned to the subcommittee, I'm a stranger in a strange land in the uh, Judiciary Committee, but I've enjoyed this process so far. And the, the, um, the cleanup uh, committee substitute before us uh, seeks to amend a, a, 1990, a 1939, bear with me, your attorneys, 1939 um, law dealing with torts. Uh, and the, the problem we're trying to correct is that the modern industry practice of harvesting timber uh, is the mills now buy a severed timber at the gate. It's referred to as gate wood by the um, by the by the mill community, if you'll say that. A huge employer throughout the state, and it was um, a situation that developed where you had a, a rogue, um, the possibility of rogue wood cutters. That's the people that go and negotiate with a landowners purchased um, timber on the stump, then sever it and then sell it to the uh, pre-negotiated uh, deals with various uh, purchasers. And again, this is large uh, mills that are sawmills throughout Georgia. Uh, it's to, to make sure that, um, that it's very clear under the code that this severed timber, when it's purchased at the, day, at the gate, it falls under the UCC, Uniform Commercial Code, which clearly states that it's, a, it's a goods being purchased in the ordinary course of business. So with a lot of help with the, this committee and a, a lot of education on my part, uh, this uh, committee substitute gets us to where we want to go. And rather than try to explain the code to a bunch of attorneys, I just, I'll leave the questions up to the attorney representing, the, re, representing us on this matter. And it's Mr. Ivy Cable. Well, thank you, Representative Williamson. Mr. Cale, I know we uh, went through this extensively in subcommittee, and uh, you've also been in touch with my office over the past two weeks since uh, that. Um, uh, from your review of this substitute that's before us here today, is this, uh, you think this draft is, do you have any objections to this draft? We have no objections to this draft. All right, here. great. Uh, anything else that you want to add at this time other than what Representative Williamson said. We appreciate the comments at subcommittee. Uh, we tried to take those into account in coming up with this, and we think that this takes the statute from what I'd call good uh, to better. And All right. So that's our goal. Well, that is everyone's goal in this room, I know. So uh, in we have. In particular, I just wanted to thank my former seat mate in the Rules Committee, Representative Stacey Evans, for her input and uh, encouragement along the way, as well as the chair. Have a question from Chairman Fleming. Chairman Fleming. Councilor, thanks for being here today. Yes, sir. Representative. Um, so 
just trying to get my head around it. Tell me succinctly what the law is and what we're changing it to, what the current law is and what we're changing it to. Um, succinctly, we have a 1939 tort statute on the books that allows for a the legal the holder of legal title as security in timber to recover a certain quantum of damages, which would be uh, the value of the timber, not to exceed the amount of money that's owed by the debtor at the time of the conversion. So that's the, that is the current law. The also current law is the 2002 UCC that exempts timber from the farm products exception. So basically the timber would qualify for treatment by a buyer in the ordinary course so that it could be taken free of any security lien, etc. The change that we have today simply makes very express the interplay between those two statutes. So it started as the changes that you see basically on the second page lines 42 through 45 where we just cross reference one existing statute to the other. There was some language that we have proposed for 51 12 51 that the subcommittee had some comments on because we wanted to make the legislative intent that you get damages under 51 or 50, but not both if you're the holder of a collateral interest. So we think- Let, 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 me, let, me, ask that, it, let me ask it this way, if yeah. I may. What's wrong and how are we fixing it? We're, what's wrong is the statute doesn't cross-reference the UCC. And what problem does that cause? You have to go to court and get a court decision to prove that it doesn't, that the UCC controls. So, uh, so it might be helpful if you give the illustration, the facts uh, situation, Representative Williamson, that you did in subcommittee here for full. So I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about in regards to that, but so there's one penalty for timber theft and that's the treble damages. That's when somebody either intentionally or, or just it sort of ignores the property line and goes on and grabs somebody else's t timber. Um, the and, and and this won't separate. Make that it's my understanding. The way this is worded is that it protects the treble damages for the timber theft. At the same time for that severed timber that's going in the, into the marketplace in the ordinary course of business is clearly covered by UCC <clears throat> law. So when the both in the lending institutions understand that full well as in they're here in agreement on this measure, as well as the uh, timber industry that it, that buys the wood at the gate. All they, all they tell the, the purchaser is this is how much we're paying per ton, but these uh, various widths of logs. And as long as the logs aren't too big, as long as they fit the saws, they go everywhere from saw timber all the way down to uh, pulp wood. Um, and, and historically, as I understand it, back in 1939, it was a more of a vertically integrated process. The mills uh, might actually own the timberlands, the forest lands, and they might go to the bank and uh, the, the deeds to secure debt included the standing timber. Well, I guess it always includes the standing timber, but, um, but when they went out and bought, there would be timber deeds involved, uh, but that whole process has gone away and now the gate wood comes in um, randomly all day long at the various mills and they can they, they can shut off the purchases if they if the mills are full so, so mr chairman if i may sure. it, it sounds like the ucc if applied gives protection to somebody of some sort correct yeah and that's what we're making sure that protection so tell me what the protection is and who 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 we're protecting here and how does that question make sense yes i th I, I think we're giving certainty to to bankers and we're giving certainty to wood buyers okay so and what certainty are we giving and what protection are they giving we're, here we're 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 basically eliminating an argument that somehow 51 12 51 could be applied in a vacuum without paying attention to the ucc and how does that help the bank 
it, it helps the banks know, well, first of all, the Georgia Bankers Association is on board with this. I've got that, but how does it help the banks? What, what, what problem that is created are we solving here? So somebody's got to get hit with something bad they don't want to get hit with, and we're fixing to protect them from it. What and is I alluded that? to that fact that if you have a, if you have a uh, excuse me for interrupting, yeah. but but if you have a uh, basically crooked wood dealer, that's a okay. wood dealer that All goes right. out and negotiates with the orf, I mean the widows that inherit a big track of timber or whatever, they might go buy timber from them, buy timber from other places, and um, and just well that's timber timber theft. Bear with me here, that that may borrow money from a bank and then sell, I'm gonna, let me re-clarify. So they borrow money from a bank based on timber contracts where they've gone and negotiated with various landowners to buy the stand in timber, knowing that they can get the delta of a profit, taking it as gate wood to these mills. And then when they take it to the mills, they're not, uh, they're, they're not repaying the bank. Now the mills, are, during this whole time have been buying it as if it was covered by the UCC goods in the ordinary course of business. But then what? Which means if you buy in the ordinary course of business, you're not susceptible to a th charge of helping the thief steal it and thus have to pay damages for it. And, unless somebody comes back in and sues the, the mills, which has actually happened, demand letters to the mills saying, hey, you bought, you bought, uh, you bought uh, Gatewood that was harvested by somebody we lent money to and you owe us that money back because they didn't pay us. Okay. Is that the yeah, I think layman's I, explanation? I've been thinking about this, the direct answer to your question is that the mill, the timber industry benefits because their current business practices, the statutes are aligned to very, very plainly show that the current business practice of the Georgia timber industry is covered under the UCC. There is no loser here because the banks don't have any rights under this statute as it is. All right, so we're gonna hear from the witnesses that are signed up, Elizabeth Chandler, Tom Byer in the hall. Uh, Maddie, would you please bring them in, please? Do we need to step away? Or? Yeah, if, uh, Representative, if you would just slide down, Mr. Cato, thank you so much for being here All today. Right, Appreciate it. If you would just hold tight, maybe in the hall, in case there are any follow-up questions. What, what, can I ask you a question, Mr. Chairman? Sure. All right, so guy borrows money for Timberland, takes his timber to the mills, and then doesn't pay the bank. The mills are currently being sued for that timber loan, and we're going to stop that. The There's the potential for that under a – uh, artful interpretation. And we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to stop. That. We're going to clarify. What we're going to do is clarify what I think those reading the law believe the state of the law to be. Gotcha. But because there's uncertainty about it, that will be addressed. So it takes a while for me to understand things. You, you, get, you get there eventually. <laughs> yeah, no. Right. No. All right. Um, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tom Byer with the Georgia Forestry Association. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. I was a little delayed on the 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 audio back there. So I'm not exactly sure what the last thing was said, but we fully support this uh, legislation work with the Georgia Bankers Association throughout the fall. And uh, from what I could gather from what I could hear on the audio, the protection that uh, uh, Chairman Fleming was asking about was that buyer in the ordinary course protection that really gives uh, those buyers of cut timber certainty that they can continue to, to buy those loads free and clear. And that's how we've been operating for 83 years until this whole issue with this 39 law came into effect and cast out as to whether there was some kind of potential conflict there. So the legislation simply seeks to make clear that what we've been doing for a long time uh, reigns supreme because that's what the UCC says and just want to make that airtight with this legislation. So I, um, I, Thank you for your testimony. And I know Chairman Fleming's questions are uh, questions that I've had also throughout this process. And I appreciate the uh, work that you've done in yeah, communication absolutely. with our office so that uh, we bring this final committee substitute for you, you all to consider here today. So, Ms. Chandler, if you'd like to come on forward um, and, uh, and testify, please. Thank you for being here today. If you just state uh, your name and who you're with and um, any comments that you have about the substitute to House Bill 90. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Elizabeth Chandler with the Georgia Bankers Association. And as I mentioned to the subcommittee, 
um, we have we, we appreciate being included uh, in this process of developing this bill and and we're in support. Thank you. All right, any questions for Mr. Byer and Ms. Chandler? All right, seeing none, thank you so much for being here. All right, um, at this point in time, I'll entertain a motion. There's a motion to pass on House Bill 90 LC 412887S. Is there a second? Motion is second. Any discussion, amendments? All right, hearing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Let's uh, have online. Anybody? Aye. Very good. All right. And all opposed? And anyone online opposed? All right. Hearing none, the bill passes unanimous. Um, we have to the sponsor, Representative Williamson. I don't know if you all can get word to him if he's not in here. We have rules committee forms in here that he can complete today. Uh, there you are. Thank you. And um, we can go ahead and get those signed today so that those will be taken care of. Thank you. Did I pick those up out here? Or? We have them uh, for you right here. So, yeah, great. All right. So we'll move on to our next bill that we have on the agenda is uh, House Bill 212 and Representative Carpenter's in the back. So if you'd come on up, we will hear your bill next. All right. Thank you, Chairman. House Bill 212, simple bill. Uh, we've talked about it before. It's passed this body last year and it's passed the Senate two or three times. Now, basically, it just clarifies some gray area in the law about issuing uh, do not resuscitate orders. And it basically says that you, I say you shall, uh, it shall require a consent of the uh, person in custody or the parents of the child. I'll be glad to take any questions. Uh, basically, it's this is what what's called Simon Law. You've, we've seen it throughout the nation. Uh, current, I think, the, started out in Missouri uh, when Simon uh, had a, his parents. He was not resuscitated, and his parents were not allowed to have a say because the doctor put the order in his file. So, I'd be glad to take any questions. The uh, only change out of subcommittee is that, or the subcommittee adopted the definition of parent, which was the same language approved last year as it was approved by this committee. Is that correct? That, that's correct. It basically just trying to make sure we keep foster parents and people uh, in, in that, in that category. So the, um, this came out of Scoggins subcommittee. What number are you chairman Scoggins? Anything you want to add? I think, I think it's a great bill, man. Thank you. Representative Carpenter for bringing it. All right. It got a due pass recommendation out of your committee. Yes, sir. As here. Thank you. All right. Uh, chairman Oliver. I don't think this changes the law that exists that uh, somebody has the right to go to juvenile court to substitute the parent's authority. I think that's pretty standard case law. And that, that happened, uh, Cho is in my district, so I've been familiar with some of those cases that come out of that. But I don't believe that changes the law. Foster care parents are not the legal custodian, by the way. It's only, deep, it's only the state of Georgia that's the legal custodian. So. This does not give a foster care parent the authority, I don't think. I think that's correct. And I just see with legal authority is yeah. the uh, definition yeah. that's provided here along the lines of what you're saying. I don't have a um, statement maybe to the broader uh, position, but just looking within this statute, there are still the, uh, if the parents are unreachable, there are still the other, right. there's other criteria that's Absolutely. permitted participated in some of those tragic situations where the parents authority was being contested by the state of Georgia. Uh, sure. I think that I, I just don't remember all the details about this bill, but I don't think this changes the law in terms of the area that I'm concerned about. Okay. All right. Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was just curious, you mentioned that this bill has passed through here a couple times in the Senate. What, what's been the problem i'm just curious you know, um, that's a good question i, I think that that question lies answer. above above me ma'am um i think last year it got hung up in rules because we ran out of time uh, but you know before that who knows all right i don't see any other questions thank you representative carpenter all right at this point in time i'll uh yes representative Walensky. go ahead uh, Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative, just carrying over subcommittee, this bill still does not use the word shall in it, right? 
I think I think so. Yeah, I tried to get them to change it to simplify it, but you know they they did not. It does not. Thank you for this great bill. <laughs> I like your hair, by the way. It looks fantastic. All right. <laughs> so at this point in time, we will call or I'll hear a motion if there is one. Do motion do pass by Chairman Fleming. Is there a second? All right. Any amendments or discussion about the bill? Hearing none, the question on House Bill 412919S, LC number. So committee substitute to House Bill 212. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? All right, the bill passes unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank That's you. That's a record for judiciary. We'll have a uh, rules committee form. If you wouldn't mind filling that out before, you don't have to, but if you're willing to fill it out before you leave, I'll go ahead and sign it right now. All right, very good. So our next bill on the calendar is House Bill 263. Chairman Scoggins, if you'd come forward. I'll actually give you a choice. If you'd like, you can stay at your seat or you can come forward, whichever you prefer. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, bring to you today House Bill 263. Um, this is a bill that uh, affects the probate judge's retirement fund, and all this does is changes the amount that a spouse could draw from uh, from the probate judge, and that's all. It changes the rate to make it more uh, fair with the other uh, retirement funds across the state. And I have uh, Bob Carter with me, who manages the probate judge's retirement fund, and I'll let him speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. What this really does, if you see on line 26 and 27, right now we're currently stuck with a mortality table for 1951. And as you well know, the mortality rates have changed considerably since then. Almost all the other retirement plans created by this General Assembly have already had this wording in there that they can update their mortality tables with the recommendation of their actuary to bring it to normal where you would want to go with the mortality tables. And that's all this does is let the board choose a more normal and a more current mortality table. And Mr. Carter, does this or to the sponsors, does this have any fiscal impact whatsoever? It's not a, or is it a fiscal bill? It is a fiscal bill according to the note on here, but it, uh, I talked to our actuary that does the fund actuarial work. He said it would be minimal, if any, on the, uh, on the, the funding of, of the fund itself. Okay, my understanding was this legislation has no fiscal impact to the state, is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. All right. So, uh, any I think questions? The only reason they class audit classified it as a physical bill, because if you're of the age, you're the recipient of a secondary benefit, that benefit may be greater because of the longevity in there. And that's all the physical impact it has right. on the retirement fund. Is this subject to the two year requirement for bills? It will be. Okay. That's pretty much it. All right. Any questions from members of the committee? All right, Chairman Gunner. Um, when we were in subcommittee, uh, I don't guess I asked the question right. So it, this is a two-year bill. Is that right? That's correct. Through, through the I process? did not see the physical note until after the subcommittee meeting. Okay. And I was really surprised that audit classified this as a physical bill because it's very okay. minimal. So it's really a housekeeping bill. So Mr. Chairman, this. Uh, if, uh, if you can pass it out of committee, it can go forward uh, next year with a study this year on the actual cost of it. So you're trying to get it to the general calendar, yeah. is that it? Okay. Right. Thank All right. Well, I think what we're going to do, that's a little inconsistent with what we heard in subcommittee. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold on the bill right now and uh, run those checks on it. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have uh, buttons back there. What's your number, Chairman Burchett? Okay, go ahead. And, and this um, may belabor the point, but I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, what is the percentage of interest? Um, it's five and a half for 1951. So for a current mortality um 
table, what's the, what's the interest? Our actuaries, uh, we would have to get him to confirm this, but somewhere around three and a half called the current rates on insurance and on interest rates on the public market. Thank you. Well, based upon what we've heard today from Mr. Carter, it sounds like there's no, uh, no problem to holding this up because bills that are pending in rules next year will come back to the committee they came from anyway. So, uh, so we'll just, uh, continue this bill today and maybe we'll all compare notes offline and clear up any misunderstanding if there, if there was one. So, all right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. So, um, don't often get to do this, but what I'd ask is to turn this meeting over to the vice chair and take the witness uh, chair myself so that uh, we can move forward. And if Mr. Amadi is in the hallway and he can hear me, maybe he can come on in. No, that's fine. Gee, I the wrong copy of that. That one right there is this one, 333. Yeah. Thanks. All right, Chairman Estration, whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, today I present to you House Bill 333. It's as introduced, LC 412910. I have with me today Mr. David Amati, uh, who's a director of uh, the State Ethics Commission, which uh, we all uh, call it, but it's the Georgia Government Transparency and Campaign Finance Commission. The um, bill that, that I'm presenting you here today is styled the Ethics and Government Act of 2021. And really what you're gonna hear is that it addresses many issues that have been noted or arisen uh, subsequent to our most uh, recent modifications to uh, our ethics laws in Georgia really address some questions uh, where there may be in um, areas of the code and um, uh, really make things explicit as to what the requirements are and the commission's abilities might be. And if it's all right, Mr. Chairman, I'll just do a section by section run through the bill right now. So um, first you'll see that we've, we're in section two, we are updating the this is line 17 and 18. We're updating the chapter name to accurately reflect the name of the commission. In section three, we have the definitions and we begin with the first definition is electioneering communication. This is a codification of case law that's uh, been uh, developing over the years. So the brief history here is you had the Buckley versus Vallejo case where the eight magic words, uh, vote for, vote against, things like that had to be specified for this type of communication. And since then in FEC versus McConnell, uh, the standards that you see here for electioneering communication was determined uh, by the court. And, um, and so we're just reflecting that here in statute. And I think what you'll hear is the vast, vast, vast majority of spending is uh, done without using those eight magic words. And so this is far more applicable to um, the type of uh, type of spending that we've seen. And I might, you know, an example of that would be rather than vote for Chuck F. Stration, vote against Chuck F. Stration, it'd be Chuck F. Stration has done a great job as judiciary chairman, or Chuck F. Stration has done a very poor job as judiciary chairman. Without using those magic words, it's still for the purpose of having an outcome in the election. Uh, so loan, the code is currently without a definition for loan. <clears throat> so we're addressing that. Membership organization is a definition which is also used within the code here, and this gets into some uh, specific details, but the bottom line is we need a definition in code for what that is, and so that's what we're providing. Personal asset also is referenced within the code we'll get to in just a moment. We're providing a definition. Under public officer, so there was some ambiguity with A, this is, I'm on lines 53 to 55, with every constitutional officer. So what's been done is all the statewide constitutional officers are specified. And then you'll look in 56, there's a catch-all for every other officer, just so that's uh, explicit. 
And then I'm down to line 65 to 67. Staff attorney is defined because we're going to use staff attorney later in this bill to uh, define effectively um, practices and the ability of the commission in circumstances when necessary. All right, section four, um, pursuant to an executive order several years ago, the um, office, the commission was assigned to the state accounting office that just wasn't updated in code. So we're updating it here. And it actually makes sense because the commission should not be responsible or should not be attached to an agency which it is charged to oversee. All right, in section five, uh, there was some ambiguity I'm on lines 84 to 85 as to uh, the uh, reporting or disclosure. And so what we're specifying here is, is we all are aware there are campaign contribution disclosures and personal financial disclosure statements. So this just specifies both of those. And uh, the language that struck um, is due to the changeover that occurred several years ago where locals had to submit certain reports to the state and some confusion or, uh, or a holding requirement that was required for the commission. We're clearing that up by removing that from the code so that there's no question as to a responsibility for holding what would now be very old reports. All right, if uh, you move then to the next page, um, there has, uh, the commission has requested uh, specificity in this area of the code that a staff attorney employed by the commission would also have the ability to bring a complaint. And the comparison that I might give is uh, right now, any ordinary citizen can file a campaign finance uh, complaint, but the commission itself does not have the explicit ability to in the code. So we're clearing that up by making clear that they can, which really gives, I would say, the commission parity with any other Georgian uh, to be able to initiate those, uh, those um, initiate the process. Yeah, please. And, and just to clarify, um, and just to clarify, Chairman Abstration, we are not changing in practice what we've been doing. We have filed our own cases for decades, but because of the ambiguity, we have had um, litigation and appellate litigation that can stall and delay these cases for three, four, five years at tens of thousands of dollars of expenses to taxpayers, which ultimately we always win. The courts have said, of course, you can file your own cases, but this is, this is about time, money, and public trust and not wondering why it took eight years to get to the bottom of an investigation. So I just didn't want anyone thinking we were changing something in practice. We're just clarifying uh, to sort of eliminate this frivolous litigation. All right, so if we move to lines 123 to 124, this is the attorney's fees um, clause. And uh, the circumstances here would be, just to kind of give an explanation of how this plays out, is that if a complaint is filed and the commission determines that there's probable cause for the complaint to go forward, and really a commission attorney is in support of the complaint, the determination that, that there is probable cause is made by the commission. And um, it would be, it's not really the complainant that's bringing it at that point. It is the commission that's bringing forward the complaint based upon their review of the initial complaint that was made. And so it doesn't, it's inconsistent to have um, uh, potential attorney's fees uh, I don't know if liability exposure it, exposure to the complainant when the commission is determining that's appropriate to proceed at that point in time, and and I would also say it it potentially would chill a possible complaint because of that potential exposure as well. So, um, so that's why we're striking that line. Anything to add there? Just that um, to to and I agree with Chairman Abstration. I'd also say that to argue as it's currently written that uh, attorney's fees can be brought if the complainant doesn't attend the hearing, well, the complainant doesn't have standing. So what does it matter if they attend the hearing or not? And I think that when you compare that to a rule on attorney's fees creates some real, I would argue, constitutional issues. So we're trying to clear that up here. Section six deals with the language that um, we're including again is uh, initial standing by the staff attorney. 
as was referenced earlier, but also striking the lines in 138 to 140. Now I'll just say these protections are in code elsewhere, actually earlier within this bill that's it's reiterated that the probable cause standard is still there. But what we don't want to ha have happen is this final sentence to be used to cause confusion, effectively arguing that it can't, the case cannot move forward unless and until probable cause is established, but probable cause is not truly determined until the commission can considers it in a preliminary matter to determine whether or not there is probable cause for the case to go forward. And uh, what this could otherwise do, this sentence is to cause such confusion as to the commission's ability to even just bring the initial complaint forward that it uh, becomes almost impossible to, to bring a legitimate complaint forward because there's the inability from the outset to establish that probable cause standard. Is that fair? That's fair. And this, this sort of dovetails with the last thing we were talking about, that this ambiguity provides the groundwork for people to file what we now know is frivolous litigation. But this, this is a protection against a runaway commission that may be um, ill-motivated. That protection is still in, coded in the law in the previous section. If, it, if, if the issue is not based on a, a report a filing or a failure to file. Uh, there is still a catch-all that says the commission may be able to go do something, but they have to show the why before they start doing it. And so we're removing it from this section. It really doesn't belong in this section. This is a procedural section. It belongs in the previous one that deals with powers and limitations of power. So we're keeping it in, in section six, but we are removing it here again to help us avoid that type of litigation that has delayed cases for years. And that, and that is found in the previous section. Right, too, and correct. Yeah. correct. All right, uh, then if we move on to uh, 146 to 150, this is, uh, this also is just clearing up statutory language to make clear that um, as to any filing that. Right, so um, presently we have an unintended gap where if there is a filing or a disclosure and there is something inappropriate about it, um, for an office holder of two years, the statute of limitations is three. For an office holder for four years, the statute of limitations is five. However, it is silent as to failures to file. And if the statute is silent as to what the statute of limitations is to an issue, as it is here, it automatically reverts to the informer statute, which is only one year. So we had a case with a, a, a former elected official in the media not too long ago where we didn't catch that they had stopped filing their reports, even though the account was still open until several years later. And their response was, you only have jurisdiction over this past failure to file. And oh, by the way, we closed the account down years ago. So you have no mechanism to determine what happened to the money and, and what we did with it. And so this is bringing parity to uh, the statute of limitations for both filings and failures to file. Yeah, I'm sorry, this statute of limitations language, um, which then actually pairs with section eight, because section eight is the length of time within which records must be maintained. And so there's consistency provided there, It'd be three years or from the date of contribution, expenditure, loan, gift, uh, from the date of that occurrence for an office of less than four years term and for an office of four years or more, it would be five years. The, um, and then also we have, we preserve the constitutional amendment, referendum, local issue language that was in the previous code and, and have given it a three year record, uh, three year period to maintain records. Section nine uh, is just an issue where it appears that the wrong word was used in code. So um, rather than a contribution to a charitable organization, it's a donation. So donations is uh, used to clear that up. <clears throat> Line 214 to 217, uh, there um, has been in, uh, well, this makes clear that a candidate cannot utilize campaign purposes, campaign funds, excuse me, for the purpose of making loans or investments to the candidate himself or herself, that candidate's business, the candidate's trust, that candidate's nonprofit organization, or a 
member of the family of the candidate, just to ensure that campaign funds are not used in some way for personal benefit. And along those lines to ensure that campaign funds are not uh, used for used as a personal asset, which has been defined uh, here as well. Uh, the commission may adopt rules and regulations for how to implement that to make sure that that's clear and that there's no ambiguity as to whether or not uh, some campaign expenditure um, uh, might be considered that. Next C in section 10, the uh, electioneering communication to affect the outcome of an election so that that definition is utilized for the type of spending that uh, that we're seeking to capture and is consistent with updates in case law. Section 11, I uh, learned about this from Director Ramadi, but uh, apparently the way the current statute is written, which you can see prior to the amendment, the uh, contribution limit is increased depending on the cycles within which candidates uh, faced and that what this could result in is different limits for different candidates running for the same office due to there being a different number of cycles that had occurred in that candidate's history. There was just a special election, I believe, this week, and that would be considered an election cycle that had occurred. So what we're doing is providing uniformity across the board that's determined by the gubernatorial election and then is, uh, is set uh, through um, is set in the same $100 increments. Yeah. All right, uh, section 12 is if money is received, campaign contributions are received for an upcoming election cycle, which does not occur, this makes it clear that the funds must be returned. So an example of that would be if a candidate were to accept contributions for a runoff and the candidate doesn't make the runoff, those contributions must be returned. Um, or, um, uh, and it's my understanding that's consistent with federal law as well with FEC rules. Yep. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, what, what section are you on again? 12. Yeah. And I missed, I apologize, I missed that information. Would you say that again? Yeah, sure. So if you do not advance to a subsequent cycle and you had collected contributions in anticipation of advancing, you must return those funds. You and the, that's right. You cannot. Um, by the way, you cannot spend, so hypothetically, if a candidate was in the uh, primary and collecting money for the primary runoff and the candidate did not make the, the runoff, uh, that candidate was prohibited from spending that money for the runoff anyway prior to the primary election. And so those contributions must be returned um, because that candidate did not reach that cycle. May I ask a question on that, on that point? So currently, currently, if you win, um, there's no issue because if you have a runoff and you collected money for that runoff and you accounted for it separately, you can spend it in the runoff. Now, if you collect, can you collect money for a runoff before you know if you're going to be in one? Yeah, there's a, uh, Mr. Chairman, there's a form you can file with us that allows you to effectively bundle. And so you can double max, con you know, collect contributions for a primary and a primary runoff and a general and a general runoff all on the same date. Now you have to account for it separately and spend and allocate it separately. But we've had issues where individuals have done that. They have not advanced. They've argued to varying degrees of success that they get to keep and dispose of it however they would have normally done if they had advanced. And we've had commission rulings that have gone different ways on that. And so this is trying to codify uh, when you can keep that and when, if you don't advance, you have to give it back. If I may ask a follow-up question on that one. You run for office, you you collect money, you, let's just use round figures, you collect 10 grand, but you only spend five. You can keep that campaign open, count open for General Assembly, for example, because another election's coming in two years and you can spend it for that money, right? Mm -hmm. So you collect 10 grand and one grand of it happens to be for a runoff that you don't ever get into. So you can keep set up four grand so you can run again, but you got to return the one grand Right. For the next election. Correct. Because because it was accepted for the purposes of influencing a runoff that never occurred. All right. So I can accept uh, twenty eight hundred bucks for the primary. Right. 
I can accept 2,800 bucks for the general. If I accept $5,600 from one person and I, and I say, I'm going to spend 2,600 in the primary and 2,600 in the general, 2,800, 20, I'm sorry, 2,800, 2,800 in the general. I went to law school because it didn't involve as much math. <laughs> uh, then I don't make it to the general cause I get beat in the primary. Do I have to return that money under, under this bill? Yes. Currently or under this bill? Currently, it's unclear. Currently, it's unclear. Uh, currently, we've had different commission boards that have evaluated that issue. So I couldn't hold that money and use it two years later to run run again and spend it on the general election. No, because you didn't appear on the ballot for the for the election for which you accepted the contribution. But if you collect more than you spend in in your primary in general, you can keep it because you got elected. Correct. I think, and I think the difference there is that you appeared on the I, I ballot in that election. I yeah. see. And, and I did mention earlier, I, I am uh, not an expert on federal election law, but it's my understanding this is consistent with federal law in this regard. You must, it's, you must return contributions for an election in which you didn't appear. I never yeah. could explain the same the way you are. You're doing, <laughs> you're doing well. Well, you've, you've run for federal office, so you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But that Very was unsuccessfully, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> The um, to to the state's benefit, by the way. So, number eleven. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Monty, uh I I I think uh, Chairman Fleming asked the same question, so I apologize if it's duplicative, but I want to make sure I understand this. If if I am on the ballot in a primary, if I collect money for a primary, primary runoff, general, general runoff in an election cycle. I win the primary. There is no, and so I advance to the general. There is no runoff, but I've collected money for the primary runoff. Under the current law, as I understand it, once uh, once I move past the primary into the general phase, even though there's no runoff, that money gets absorbed into the account, correct? Currently. Currently. Uh, arguably currently, yes. Okay. And but this bill would change that, correct? And it would say you can collect money for a primary runoff. However, if there's not a primary runoff, that money has to be returned. Correct. Same for the general runoff. The I'm sorry, yes, general runoff. Because correct, because even if you didn't have a general opponent, you still appeared on the ballot. Okay, understood. My second question is, uh, um, and if, I, if I could represent that real quick but current law would require you to not spend that money for the primary runoff. So you would still have it after the, after the primary. Cor correct. Correct. Yeah. But any money not spent for an election after the election gets rolled into the, you get to, you get to roll forward. Right. Um, but so a follow-up to that, uh, under this bill would, and under that scenario, would the money, um, would the contributions collected for the primary runoff, which I'm not, which there, which doesn't exist, um, they would have to be returned versus some, some elected officials when they're closing their accounts, for example, donate to other uh, nonprofits or what have you. Uh, under this scenario, they would have to be returned to the donor versus donated to Correct. other entities, right? Correct. Because that would be a, a distribution versus a return. Correct. Okay. Thank you. So uh, the language you see in 275 to 282 is um, determination of whether or not it's a, a runoff is in play. All right, so if we move on to section 13, I'm on lines 309 to 314. This has uh, particularly been an issue with our judges who by nature of their position are automatically members of a judicial council. And the question is, is there a responsibility then to file a personal financial disclosure by virtue of just being a member of a council? And um, and our judges have to make additional financial disclosures to the, as I understand, to the Supreme Court. So they are um, already making these disclosures. This is just more to ensure that there isn't a 
second report that's required, which is a, in effect a gotcha for um, public servants who, uh, you know, shouldn't be put in that position. And so this would clear that up, that they would not have, there would not be a disclosure requirement if you are already submitting, um, submitting such a disclosure. And, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, anything in, if you file a, per, a financial disclosure, anything in that affidavit would already have been addressed in the financial disclosure. Uh, it's, it's kind of duplicative of itself. So that addresses that. Okay, so uh, there is an issue with some in some local elections where there can be requirements placed on incumbents due to their office, but similar disclosure requirements are not required of challengers to those offices. So what this does is places the same requirements on candidates for the same office so that there is an inconsistency between incumbents and challengers. And I'm in lines uh, three 27 to 336, and I'm sorry, and before that as well. Then at the end of that section, I'm on lines 355 to 357. Um, our soil and water supervisors do not raise money and some circumstances are appointed or not elected. There's some confusion as to what the reporting requirements would be. They don't campaign in the traditional sense. And so we're making clear that they do not have the same disclosure uh, requirements. Section 14 is just a drafting error in code. So it's change or addition without specificity as to what. And so it just addresses that. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions if uh, any members of the committee have them. All right, uh, Chairman Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Chairman Administration. This may be one more for David, but I'll let y'all decide. So on section nine, that whole section that is there and the changes that it is talking about, is in the area of what is a campaign contribution, correct? Is that what that part of the code no, deals with? No, this deals more with, um, so campaigns can, can uh, let's say you, you decide you're not running for re-election. You can return money to donors. You can also donate it to charities, nonprofits. Uh, this clarifies, because we've had this issue where people have attempted to, um, and, and they don't necessarily disclose it all the time, but they've given money to a nonprofit they they themselves own and have attempted to you know, pay themselves. And then when, when it's discovered, they try and call an investment. And the, the code already prohibits converting campaign money into a personal asset. So this is just sort of an attempt to say, you can't donate to something that you know, benefits you or your, your, your wife or your trust directly. So on line 230 and 231, the commission shall adopt rules and regulations for the implementation of this subsection. Does this subsection include what is the definition of a proper campaign expenditure? Yeah, uh, the code already includes that. Now, if we're modeling after the FEC, they, they evolve over time about what is a, a permissible expenditure. So recently, the Federal Election Commission said that uh, using your campaign money to pay for daycare uh, used to not be permissible, and now it is. And a lot of stuff like that comes up uh, regularly. This would say, we're just going to keep track of that by regulation so we don't have to drag it before a subcommittee every time we want to say, hey, now you can use it for daycare. Now you can use it for this type of uh, expenditure. Well, here's my, I guess, thought and what I'm trying to figure out. We as a legislature do sometimes decide to delegate to others rulemaking authorities rather than us keeping that authority for ourselves in statute. Mm -hmm. And if this subsection deals with campaign contributions and the definition thereof, we currently have decided that we as a legislature will decide what a campaign contribution or proper, I'm sorry, a campaign uh, proper expenditure is. And if we leave in there line 230 and 231, we're going to delegate that responsibility to y'all. 
So we already have, uh, maybe I'm wrong. I'm what just I, what I would say, if I could jump in, I mean, existing law you'll see in 229 is shall not constitute personal assets. So that's already in law right now. And the question is, um, how do you determine if there's a question as to that, how is that determined? And unless the general assembly is going to specify what that would or wouldn't include, there must, there would need to be some, there need to be some rules as to what that would or wouldn't apply to. And so what I, I would just say that um, this line is necessary in response to existing law, as I see it, because uh, personal assets, which we do define actually in here, but wasn't defined previously, but that's line 48 to 51. Um, could be ambiguous and um, and this would help to the commission providing rules would give clarity in that regard. And Mr. Chairman, in the power section, we already have general rule and rulemaking authority. Um, this is speci this is saying specific to this issue. We also have rulemaking authority on what constitute a personal asset, but we're not we're not creating rulemaking authority generally where it doesn't already exist. Then why add it? It, it uh, we felt specifying as to this particular issue because it had come up so many times would would give clarity to our ability to um, define and specify. Uh, what constitutes a personal asset, what is being updated as is, is being excluded from that. Did it come up so many times because other people argued that it was we, the legislature? Yes. That had the authority to define what we, proper expenditure was? We, we fought over this issue a few times, correct? Well, I'm, I'm, for one, cautious okay. when we as a legislature give away the authority that we've decided to keep to ourselves. Now we do it all the time and we have to do it and need to sometime. And this may be where very well argued to be one of those times, but I, I guess my mind goes back to at other times when other people may have been involved in the commission. And I never will forget um, Penny Houston telling the story in caucus one time of how she had to hire a lawyer because she bought Coca-Cola's for her firemen in the 4th of July parade. And that was determined to be an improper expenditure of campaign contributions. She called me uh, and, and talked to me about that. I said, I said, Penny, you don't understand. This is no way in the world that that then commission, not you, sure. made that determination. But that's why one reason I'm very cautious on us giving away our ability to define what is or what is not a campaign contribution and turning it over to somebody else, because I have seen it abused in the past, in my opinion. I, I, um, I definitely take the chairman's point and um, this, uh, you know, we need the law to, to um, we have to give careful consideration of the law that we pass, regardless of who may lead the commission or what the membership of the commission might be in the future. Um, I guess my question would be, and this is, this is not, I'm not requesting an, an answer now, but it's uh, what would stop a commission from doing something similar right now? Uh, the fact that when they tried in the past, people have, have evidently su successfully or either partially argued that no, it is us, the legislature, that has the ability to do that, and not clearly stating this here maintains that some version of that status quo. Well, and I and I'm not uh, I'm certainly not seeking to to argue the point now. I guess uh, the objective here, providing it, is for there to be clear ground rules from the outset, so that. When everyone knows what the rules are, everyone can follow the rules. And Mr. Chairman, I would say as we work through this and think about it, let maybe us establish those clear ground rules rather than turning that power over to a commission. Well, you can take a look at personal asset that's proposed here as to what the definition would be. And I suppose if the, um, you, if the commission's action were to exceed the definition of personal asset, which is provided here, then there, uh, the argument could be made that the commission will be exceeding the very careful uh, boundaries that we set for them if this bill were to be passed. I think you, you understand what I'm saying. I'm not, again, I'm not seeking to argue the point with, with you here today and any language you want to propose, I would be absolutely happy to consider. But the, um, the definition of personal asset being in here will hopefully provide some parameters within which any future commission, uh, should this be passed, would know that uh, it's restrictive of their 
Is there a new Rule definition making. of public asset in here that I'm that I missed? Personal I'm, assets. Yes, sir. I may I may have missed. It. Is that back at the beginning? Yes. Line forty eight. So practically, if I may ask, what does that mean? 19.1. I think it'd be in the form of uh, taking money. You're asking for a real world, real world example. Trying to figure out yeah. how, to, how to supply it. Yeah. yeah, it'd be utilization. I'm thinking about that of, example I gave with Penny Houston. Yeah, it'd be utilization of uh, money for personal use. And are you? Are you asking for an example of how this has been done in the past? Well, th th y'all put that there for a purpose to change something. I'm trying to figure out what, what, it, what it is and what we're changing it to. So this is one of those areas where we're not, I don't think this changes how the commission has interpreted anything, but this clarifies and eliminates the argument on the front end. We've had um, a case where an individual took $100,000, well, took a, a, an amount of money out of the campaign account, used it for the purchase of real property. And um, only after we discovered it, tried to claim that it was not a personal asset, but instead an investment into a permissible uh, uh, expenditure. And these definitions are clarifying, you can't invest in yourself because that's, that's personally enriching yourself and be a personal asset would include uh, real property or, or something to that effect. So if I wanted to buy a campaign truck to put up signs, I could, I could or could not do this with this in here. You could do it in this scenario um, because you're using it for campaign purposes. Okay. Um, but when you're done using it, you have to sell it and the money, the, the proceeds go back to the campaign, whatever depreciated value it has. But it, but you couldn't use it to buy a truck just to drive around in personally. And I think that, I think the, I certainly understand the delegation argument. I'm sensitive to that. I, I get what you're saying, but I think possibly the, uh, commission providing that exact procedure would be helpful to candidates in that position. So it's, you know, what do I do with this, uh, with this truck after the election? Could I suggest as a possible alternative just for you to bat around in your head, allow the commission to draw up what those rules will be and bring them to us and let us put them in statute? Well, I, I don't want to speak for Mr. Motti, but I think he said a minute ago that kind of stuff changes over time. And the concern mm -hmm. is that you, you're going to have to uh, come back and amend the statute. Well, and I mean, again, I'm not the object. I don't want this to seem argumentative, but uh, consistent with the FEC and how this same problem, this is this issue is not unique to Georgia, no, but if there are. Uh, in similar circumstances, the regulatory authority is able to provide regulations and is able to change it through their board process so that that's known by the, uh, by the candidates, known by the campaign organizations, and you're able to plan for it and act accordingly. And there aren't gray areas. I think that confusion as to ambiguity is not good for, uh, or due to ambiguity is not good for anyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, I've got uh, Representative Evans, Representative Holcomb, and then over to Representative Oliver. So I'll start with Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, there's a lot of chairmen here. <laughs> um, my first question is um, dealing, this is in section 12, it's lines 275 to 282. I just wanna make sure I'm understanding on line 279, the um, reference to the 2% to a margin of greater than 2% to consider you being advanced to the general. Is that because that's the recount trigger? I think, I think that was a consideration. What we were trying to do is, was, what we were trying to do was make clear when you had advanced and could start spending. And we gave a couple different options. And that was one of the things we looked at in incorporating sort of a, a multi, a multi-purpose definition of if they concede or if it's certified or if it's of a margin so great that it's not going to change um, that you can go ahead and safely start spending your next cycle's uh, campaign funds. Okay, and I don't have language in mind yet, but I have a little bit of a concern that if you are in a situation where, you know, the certification happens a little bit late, um, your opponent's not conceding for whatever reason, um, and you're not above that 
that threshold, but you need to, you got a really competitive general election coming up and you need to get going um, to, 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 to tie people on that. I have some concern about that and I'm wondering if we might be able to account for that in some way. So this is prior to certification, but it's prior to certification of the uh, outcome of the primary. Right, because I mean, at the end of the primary, if it was that competitive, you're going to be broke, and if 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 you're stuck and you can't spend, that could be a problem. Yeah, I would I would be open to any input that you might have about how that can be cleared up, but. Um, and I'll think about it even while we're here. I just wanted to make sure I was understanding why we had that. So I will um I'll see what I can come up with, and then my other question is um on lines starting at line 322 where you were talking about putting in the same requirements for challengers that we have for current elected officials and it wasn't jumping out to me as i was trying to read through this what are some examples that we of burdens we're going to be putting on or responsibilities depending on how you want to put it of challengers that currently don't apply to them that apply to their incumbent opponents so this was um, an unintentional result of a legislative council drafting error about seven years ago. So right now, if you run for a re-election representative and you, you draw a challenger, they also have to file a financial disclosure statement like you do. But at the county level, um, if you were a county commissioner and you drew a challenger, that challenger right now doesn't have to file a financial disclosure statement as a, as a non-incumbent. And, and we've gotten a lot of complaints from the locals about this. So we're trying to trying to require non-incumbent local officials to have the same financial disclosure requirements as incumbents. Okay, is there anything else? That's all that addresses. That's okay, thank you. That's all, thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Representative Alton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I'm definitely supportive of the bill and I, I wanna ask a question about section eight um, to make sure that it goes far enough. Um, I'm not an expert in this area of the law, but I, I follow the news and I've certainly seen creative lawyering in this space, uh, which I think is part of the impetus behind this bill. And what I want to ask is, I think that these time frames make sense, but is there an obligation if you send whatever your equivalent of a subpoena is to somebody, um, does that initiate an obligation of them to preserve the original documents? Because I wouldn't want some lawyer to say, I only have to hold it for three years or four years and then, you know, get rid of them. I'm assuming that it does, but I want to make sure that it does. Uh, it does. And additionally, you're already required to maintain campaign account records. Um, right now, through an oversight, uh, you representative in a two year office have to keep those records for the previous three years. But if you are a statewide office holder with a four year term of office, if, if the logic is the statute of limitations is one year longer than the term of office, well, logically, a four-year office holder would need to, to, to maintain the records for five. Currently, that's not the case. Currently, they only have to maintain them for three. So we're trying to break this apart and say, if you're a two-year office holder, the period of time you have to maintain your records is going to be consistent with that statute. If you're a four-year office holder, it's going to be consistent with that statute. And that's why we've broken the two-year terms of office and the four-year terms apart. Okay. But, but at present, you're already required to maintain those records. But regardless of, um, of those obligations, say um, a state representative you're investigating, so a three-year statute, and you send your document requests, like some tip comes in at two years, six months. So does the obligation to preserve those documents extend as long as you're investigating and you've reached out to them? That Or is it a hard cut line of that three years, the person could potentially destroy them by saying, I only have to hold them for three years. It's the latter. Um, they, it's a hard line where they could potentially then destroy them with the exception that if we issue one of our administrative subpoenas, then to your point, they're required to maintain them regardless of what the three year, five year uh, delineation is. Okay. So you feel comfortable that you have the necessary protections to ensure that documents won't be destroyed if, if, there's a pending investigation and you're running up against one of these deadlines. Correct. And okay. And if someone does destroy them, which we can't control it, I mean, legally it creates a negative inference at that right. point. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, uh, what's your number? Representative Oliver. Thank you, Ms. Chair. I'm puzzling over 214 to 217 in section nine. And my, my basic sort of simple understanding of currently, I can take campaign money after I've left office and give it to a nonprofit. If I wanted to give it to the DeKalb Domestic Violence Center, I could do that. But if my sister or daughter worked for the DeKalb uh, Domestic Violence Center, I don't think I would be allowed to. I'm puzzling over the language on 216, candidates nonprofit organization. Um, that's what would determine whether or not I could give it to the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, or a substantial organization that may employ a family member. Can you help me? Certainly. So uh, existing in the, in the law already, we define family, and that doesn't include your sister, and it would not include a non-dependent adult child. So in that scenario you gave, you'd be able to give to your adult daughter's nonprofit uh, because she, you know, I mean, the, the family members essentially are your spouse or your dependent children. Um, I'm very aware that their nonprofits created only for the pur purpose of supporting somebody financially. They, they really have no, and that's what you don't want to. That's what we're looking at here. We've, we've, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's okay, but it, um, it's basically it's you got to give it to a real nonprofit is what this you're trying to define here and not something that personally supports you financially. Correct. We've had individuals leave office and just dump all of their existing campaign in a nonprofit that they're the executive director of, right. which tax records will later show they likely just pay themselves salary. Right. And that's that's what this is intending to prevent um, from occurring. So the candidate's nonprofit organization is not just an organization that I like, like the Girl Scout. Correct. It's one that you you have a controlling interest over. Okay. Thank you. And maybe right. for an amendment, we will need uh, to clarify that where there's a controlling interest. And Representative Burchett, what's your number? Nine. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Chairman FJH, for bringing this uh, legislation. This question is for uh, Mr. Amati. Uh, I'm on lines in Section 8, lines 181 to 183. I wondered if you considered, um, you know, it's, it looks as though you considered a two year and a four year term, but what about a six year term? Do they not have to maintain their records for the entire six years? Um, at present or under this bill? Uh, under this bill and at present, I don't, I don't know the answer. Is at, at, at present, any campaign has to maintain it for the three-year period. So a six-year office holder, currently like a four-year office holder, has to maintain it for three years. Um, uh, I guess here we have language of four or more years, so, so that five-year period would apply to a six-year office. So is there any reason, doesn't the PSC, do they... Are they six year terms? Is that correct? I believe so. Is there any reason that they wouldn't have to keep theirs for their entire term? Or is that is it just an that 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 may I mean that's something we can certainly um, tweak. Uh, that may have been an oversight on my part. I think uh, I think the six year term actually wasn't aware of the PSC, uh, but would apply to some judges. Um, and and I think that the um, I don't think that there's, if the objective is to require the maintaining of records one year beyond the service in office, I don't, I would consider that a family or a uh, friendly amendment. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right. Uh, Chairman Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Monty, I'd, I'd like to go back to something that Representative Oliver, Chairwoman Oliver was talking about and that's on lines 214 and 217. I guess I'll start with a question. I've known candidates to retire and have money left in their campaign account. I think of the late Mickey Janelle, he had almost 200,000 and he gave, golly, 100,000 to the Children's Medical Center at Augusta University where his kid, his grandchild child had, had some surgery. Um, and also I've known people to give to churches. So, I know I can give a $10,000 contribution to Chairman Estration's church if I want to. What if I belong to the church? Can I give it to, to, to I got three, four churches in my little town I live in, and I belong to one of them. Could I give 
twenty five hundred bucks to all all of them. I'm I'm sorry to interrupt, but the um but I think the amendment as I heard it from we'll fix that. Representative Aller would fix that. Okay. Because that is a great point. The yeah. candidates is ambiguous as it's written okay. here. And so it'd be uh, the candidates, I'm just thinking out loud here, but it'd be one where there's where the candidate has a controlling interest. So that clearly wouldn't ap apply to the church where you attend or um, thanks. It begins to rule it out. I agree with you. Yeah. And, we we and, could perfect that. That would be great. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I think the, the only concern would, and, and yes, I think that amendment does clarify that. Um, I think there would be good reason to say you can't give it to the church. If you're the executive director of the church, it, that would make sense. Right. But, but um, just being a member of the church, that's certainly not the intent of what we're doing here. Thank you. Yes, sir. If, if y'all could work on some clarification language reps involved, I appreciate it. Controlling interest or on the payroll. Is that what you're thinking? Right. That, that, that probably begins to eliminate the fact. Yeah. 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 I think also a comma after organization would be clear that it's not the family members to separate the family member from the nonprofit. That issue. All right. Rep Representative Scoggins. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Mine would be along the same. My question would be the long, the same line as chairman Fleming says, what if you're the pastor of the church and you were also the candidate? Could you give the money to your church? Yeah, I think that um, these are all fair questions. And I think the way it's written, you couldn't. You could not? You could not. Is that the way the law is today? It's ambiguous today. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. All right, are there any other questions? Any online? No? Mr. Chairman, uh, the committee's given us. Oh, I'm sorry, we got one back there. I think it's number 11. 11. Go ahead. Uh, I, I think this is probably uh, best for Mr. Amati. Uh, my question is just if this were, I know this, this goes into effect uh, upon the, the governor signing um, or not signing, uh, which presumably, if this goes through, would uh, go into effect before, before July 1st, right? Um, how, what is your thinking about how this would be, these changes would be implemented for the municipal elections this November, uh, and the, the, the coming 2022 cycle? In, any changes would be prospective, obviously. Um, so if, if in the municipals in 21, if anything that this bill touches had occurred before the bill became law, then I don't think. I think the old code would apply, like if that's what you're asking. So it wouldn't necessarily aff affect the municipal elections this year. Correct. It would, it would only affect the municipal elections to the extent that the contributions or expenditures, the activities occurred after the after. bill became law. Right. Okay. All right. Anyone else with a question? Mr. Chairman, I think uh, there's been some helpful uh, discussion today and some good areas to focus on as we work on language and look forward to bringing this back to the committee at, uh, at the appropriate time. All right. Okay. Now, is this the last bill? Yes, sir. All right. We're done. Thank you. Thank you.